Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> welcome to this webinar on corruption and good governance in the Caribbean. Uh, this will be a webinar for today and tomorrow, um, maybe later again in August. We will continue. But for today, we have three panelists. And what we will do, we will give each of the panelists a short time to give some introductory remarks. And after all the three panelists have done that, uh, there will be interaction between them and uh, we'll put some questions to them as well. Um, so the, <clears throat> I think this is a very good subject, corruption and good governance, because it is something that is really, um, is keeping us busy in all the Caribbean countries. And our first panelist today is Ms. Sharda Ganga. She is currently the director of Proyecta, which is a non-governmental organization focusing on issues on governance, participation, and gender equality. She is also a trainer and facilitator and an accomplished playwright, theater and film director and newspaper columnist. In 2014, Proyecta initiated and still coordinates the Suriname Citizens Initiative for Participation and Good Governments. Welcome Sharda and you have the floor. Unmute. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody. Well, uh, thank you for your opening, uh, Martin. And I'll uh, jump into my introductory remarks, which you asked uh, asked us to do late last night. Um, so I'll just jump into it. It's a um, and I'll I'll just read it. Uh, it's a statement as a kickoff, and um, I, say, I start by saying that we are not exceptional uh, in Suriname. We are not exceptional in the way we are governed, and we are not exceptional in the way that corruption manifests itself, uh, reproduces, takes over the state. Uh, you see the same. Uh, uh, you see the same way. It operates in the same way as it is uh, as it does in countries where democracies are young and democracies are old. You see it in rich and in poor countries, in the West and in the East, everywhere. Uh, corruption is embedded in, in our society, you could say, to the point where certain behaviors are not even recognized as corruption, not by citizens who think it is absolutely normal to use their connections for anything and everything, and who don't even demand equal access to goods and services not when they have a chance of gaming the system themselves. Petty corruption, favoritism, clientelism on the smallest scale exists because too many citizens don't understand the concept of their rights and the state does not see herself as ultimate duty bearer. It was telling that in his maiden speech, the newly elected vice president promised that there is no room for paternalism and self enrichment is out of the question. Clean government, he said. But why use the word paternalism? I do agree, paternalism should be banned. It should be banned in families. It should be banned in the workplace. It should be banned in the relationship between government and citizens. But do we really have a paternalistic state? I would argue that for the most part in Suriname, the state really doesn't care that much for the well-being of her citizens to, to closely watch us. Perhaps the vice president meant that there is no room for patronage and for clientelism. And I'm telling this anecdote to illustrate that corruption in Suriname is still, still barely understood in all her facets. The general public and politicians in power usually only see and recognize those forms of corruption which you might call economic or financial corruption, where money and other material benefits are exchanged. However, for years, we at Proyecta have argued that the corruption that is most harm harmful 
is not bribery and fraud and embezzlement, but nepotism, clientelism, and uh, patronage. All these, uh, uh, all of these, that is the real problem. And I said, for years we've said that, but of course, this is no longer true, as we've just survived the government that robbed us almost into default ob oblivion. When we have new governments, we literally get new governments. From ministers to cleaners, we make room for new rural, uh, uh, from ministers to cleaners. You have to make rule, room for the new rural, rule, rulers, excuse me. You have to make room for the new rural, rulers, their sons and daughters, their neighbors, their cousins, and all of their party members. This has eroded the capacity of the state to fulfill her duties, to operate a state, to deliver basic goods and services, to have any kind of planned policy intervention and long-term planning and execution. There is absolutely no institutional memory left. Ministries are owned by parties and each one makes up their own rules. There are no common procedures for accounting, for recruitment, not even for filing documents. And if political parties in power see winning elections as winner takes all, there are no boundaries between them and the state. They own whatever the state owns, the land, the cars, the gold, it is there for the taking. And so the state is prodded and manipulated to adhere to the ever-growing hunger, to their ever-growing hunger. And before you know it, we are looking at a state that is captured by the interests of parties and their business friends. I would also argue that Suriname is also susceptible to predatory rule, as there are enormous benefits to holding political power, and we are also well endowed with natural resources. We already show many characteristics of predatory rule, such as a high degree of political power concentrated in personal rule, um, sustained in, an, in, in a narrow predatory coalition without traditional customary or coherent ideological justification. I'm just, this is from a literature. Uh, we see the use of this power to control economic resources accompanied by wide discretion in their use or distribution. We see a failure to use the resources for any observable developmental purpose. We see an absence of any plausible or practical evidence of efficient or commitment to promote long-term and sustainable growth, development of the systematic provision of public goods, and so on, and so on, uh, and, and so on, and so on. Um, thankfully, we have not crossed that border yet. And I hope, uh, as we don't have at this moment coercion and brutality and force, uh, which are not yet in play. What we must have is adequate legislation to combat corruption. What we must have is adequate legislation, institutions strong enough to enforce them, and a transformation of the way parties and politics operate. And of course, we need a strong civil society as well as independent journalism. We will need watchdogs if our democracy is to survive. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard. That's a lot. Uh, we can discuss it later. In the meantime, uh, Ambassador Williams, Karen Williams has uh, joined us. Welcome, Ambassador. And I want to give you the floor to make some remarks. Your mic is off. Please turn up. There we go. There turn we back on now. Okay, and uh, apologies everyone. Uh, I was sitting waiting in the waiting room, the Zoom waiting room, uh, and, and then uh, I've just finally got let in. So thank you and, and apologies for giving the welcome in the middle of the, uh, the segment. But uh, I, I wanted to uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Scalhwake, uh, thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Ganga and uh, uh, Director Ganga and Dr. Jawar. Uh, for being here today for uh, what is a very important discussion on uh, good governance and corruption. It, it's an issue that is, is global, really. We're talking about the Caribbean today, but it is a global issue. Uh, I've served in many places in the world in which uh, corruption and the, the lack of good governance have really um, inhibited 
uh, the, the manner and the rapidity in which uh, a nation may develop. Uh, and, and being able, that ability to develop is critical uh, to all nations in order to provide for your people and to uh, give the best level of support uh, to your nation. I think there's, there's many aspects uh, to the intersection of good governance and, uh, and anti, I'll go anti corruption in this respect. And it begins with accountability and transparency. You have to have the laws in place. Uh, and then with the laws, you have to have training so that people know what they're supposed to do as, as good civil servants and as good uh, caretakers in, in public trust positions. Uh, I will say in, in, the, the, in uh, the US government and in my role, I had to have many hours of instruction on ethics and, and uh, the proper way to uh, uh, handle interactions with those who might be seeking business or services from the embassy. I've got a, a, an ethics book, probably can't, I'm, I'm holding my fingers up here, you probably can't see it on the screen here. I've got an ethics book this, quick, this, this thick uh, that I keep in my office that is full of the regulations uh, for ambassadors and for embassies in general. And, and that's not unique to, to my position. Uh, across the government in the U.S., we do have the ethics codes that we have to maintain. They're backed up by law, and there's accountability when they're broken. Uh, and all of these things work into providing confidence to the citizenry and to the um, uh, investors in country, whether they be foreign investors or locally, uh, that they have uh, a foundation upon which they can build their businesses and that they can uh, uh, have confidence that they will be treated fairly and that they will have uh, uh, the ability to uh, build those businesses, contribute into the economic development of the country and contribute to the financial structure. So uh, when we see economic crises, uh, they're not always linked uh, to corruption, but many times they are and, if they, and, and are as, uh, exacerbated by corruption. So uh, I, I can't underscore enough how much accountability and trans uh, transparency are important and that uh, the political will behind those are extremely important uh, for all sectors of society. Um, you have to have that good governance in place. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to wrap up uh, very quickly, say again, thank you and sorry for that uh, uh, delay. Um, but I also wanted to thank uh, our Hubert Humphrey Fellowship Program uh, participant and organizer, uh, Maverick uh, Buyuku, for his uh, organizing the workshop with the ideas that he developed uh, while in the US. And it's really one of the things we hope to see out of exchange programs that we do, that uh, things like this, like this uh, workshop will take place. So without further ado, thank you and pardon the interruption for giving the welcome in the middle of the moderation. Okay, thank you very much um, and for your introductory words as well and your support. Uh, it's important to have these discussions and uh, probably we should have much more, but this is a good start, I think, and, and uh, very good initiative by Mr. Buyuku. Uh, Chad, I just one question. You said that <clears throat> Many people don't recognize corruption. Can you elaborate on that a little? Um, when they, they, for example, uh, just in everyday life, um, what we, Proyecta did uh, research a couple of years ago, uh, and we looked at uh, the way people understood corruption uh, in everyday life. And what you find is that when you use the word corruption, we, uh, 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 the, uh, in general, people only, um, how do we say it, um, associate that with people in power or politic in, in, with the politicians. But their own behavior, um, well, for example, um, you need some documents or, uh, uh, hey, my, my uncle is working at the ministry where they give out land and I'm, I get preferential treatment. That is very, very normal. 
because he's my uncle. Yeah, so people are using their, the system in ways that gives them special treatment. As long, so, so um, that is one thing. Another thing that we found, if I, if I can quickly elaborate, is that uh, uh, one, one form of corruption that is totally not on the public's mind, nor on the politician's mind or wherever, is a conflict of interest. People do not understand that concept. Totally not, not on anybody's mind. Um, what conflict of interest is that you cannot hold a, 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 you cannot hold a position, you cannot be a parliamentarian, uh, you, you cannot be a, a parliamentarian and um, for example, uh, uh, and then in that capacity, you have to, um, control uh, uh, yourself if you're also the director of um, a ministry. I'm just giving an, an example or of a, of a state-owned company. Um, there's a conflict of interest is not recognized, um, for example. I'll, I'll just keep it at that. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to other aspects. Uh, I want to give the floor to Ms. Satya Jabbar. She is more from a financial background and uh, she is <clears throat> member of, or the chairman of the Institute of Public Finance. And that's a private nonprofit organization. And she is a consultant for economy and finance she was in bank management and has worked extensively with local banks, international finance organizations, and other institutions. And so she will focus more on the financial part of corruption and good governments. Satya, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Martin. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Um, let me start with um, saying that Years ago, after I graduated as an economist, I started to work at the Ministry of Finance of Suriname. And we were in the staff uh, department. And the Ministry of Finance, as you know, um, oversees all the transactions, the, um, the buying and the selling and the appropriations and so on. And um, <clears throat> It was a world of itself, right? All the procedures and the processes and the forms and, 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 and what you call it. I saw some very, then back then, I saw some very good processes uh, in financial management, how to keep track of things. And, and there were some others that were quite weak and, and needed strengthening as to how you allocate money, how you appropriate money, how you spend money, and how you account for money. Mm. In, the, in the time since then, I saw that this, this process of money, of financial management within the governments, not only in Suriname, uh, this, this process has weakened a lot. And I'm not really sure yet what's the cause for that um you can guess maybe the, the there is political involvement but there is also people um who do not really understand the concept of indeed governance good governance versus bad governance and that is why in the further of this in the further um part of this uh presentation i am really going to focus on how is it possible? How was it possible that despite rules and regulations and handbooks and uh, protocols and what have you to spend money or to, to acquire goods and services, there is an increasing tendency of corruption, not only in Suriname, again, we see it in the entire region. We see it uh, in the world. Um, where is this coming from? Why is this developing? Why is this happening? And to that end, um, I will not go into uh, 
uh, chair, chairman, I will just not going to the processes and the proce procedures and the handbooks and the rules and regulations, but I have turned the question around. I have said, where is corruption the least in the world? And there are a few um, uh, uh, very interesting examples of countries where corruption on the Transparency International Index are like in the 90s uh, of, of 100. And um, it has everything to do with the social structure of the country and the, the composition of the kind of the people of the population, how they are organized, how they are related and not. But we will go further into that as we go into the causes of um, probable causes of uh, of corruption and uh, what are the requirements for good governance? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Satya. Um, I think that's that's a big question when we go into the causes. So let me uh, put that to all three of you later. But give Mr. Shores uh, for you the floor first. And he is working at the moment at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And until recently, he was also doing work for the National Endowment for Democracy. And he is teaching at Georgetown University in the Democracy and Governance Graduate Program. George, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Martin. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, actually to meet uh, mo most of you and, and add to this conversation. Perhaps to build on the, the previous two speakers and also some of the comments from the ambassador, maybe just a few observations that broaden the, the perspective out maybe more broadly to the region. Uh, what strikes me is sort of the juxtaposition of some of the factors uh, that were just mentioned. The the sort of ingrained sort of attitudes regarding uh, bad governance, if you will, certainly a corruptive uh, behavior and the growth, the relative growth of that environment, juxtaposed with the fact that the Caribbean region as a whole, by and large, is actually well endowed with a number of factors that ultimately should be able to manage uh, these trends, uh, including relatively developed a set of regional institutions, uh, mechanisms, and also a, a by, again, on average, uh, governance in the region which tends to subscribe to uh, democratic uh, norms, uh, transparency, rule of law, uh, relatively open, robust uh, media, and active uh, civil society. Uh, so those in some ways, the, the ingredients are there for ultimately the issues of governance and corruption to be managed, uh, but obviously uh, not, strong, not strongly enough. Secondly, as I just mentioned, the Caribbean actually, it's not unusual around the world now, but the Caribbean is also has a fairly robust set of, of not only civil society institutions, but actually a network of those institutions that interact among themselves regionally as well as more globally. Uh, the technology, social media ultimately has added a little bit to the effectiveness, the ability to mobilize on some, some issues. And then thirdly, uh, to go back to the, to the region, there are institutions who ultimately should have, if you will, and have buried in their structures, uh, in their levels of authority and how they're organized, uh, mechanisms that ultimately address or should address more effectively uh, corruption. Um, the CARICOM may be, for some of the members of the region, may be uh, one mechanism and sort of its specialized uh, thematic sub, uh, subgroups, Caribbean Development Bank, uh, the Caribbean Court of Justice, which only applies to some countries. So there's an institutional set of mechanisms that already exist and to me strikes me in some ways as an opportunity to link those institutions more closely to the issues of good governance and, uh, and corruption. Clearly, the reality, uh, as already has been mentioned, uh, is not as positive as I'm trying to suggest. 
uh, money, illicit transactions, uh, public sector corruption uh, is present throughout the uh, throughout region. As already was mentioned, the enforcement mechanisms, even if the rules are on the books, are relatively uh, weak or at least uh, uneven. And in some countries, uh, the process ultimately breaks down rather dramatically uh, in terms of good governance, the, the, the outcome, the messy outcome of the recent uh, election, Guyana is a good example. Uh, Haiti is another case where all of the above, which I've just said, sort of applies uh, multiple, with a multiply factor. Uh, I'll leave the analysis of Suriname uh, to my distinguished uh, fellow panelists. Thank you. Okay, thank you, George. Um, actually, I think we we have this main question as what are the causes of corruption and, and why is good governance not the rule, uh, but why it, it was before it seems in the Caribbean, we had a lot, we had much more good governance than we have now. So what, what happened? Um, I would say any one of you, uh, maybe Sharda, can you start with that? You wonder what happened? No, the causes of corruption and why good governance is less now than it was before. Um, but Martin, why do you think it was? Uh, well, I'm going to ask then, why do you, was it really different? Uh, was there a stronger uh, good governance, governance before? I don't know. Um, maybe things are just um, manifesting, manifesting uh, uh, themselves more clearly now, but I don't know if that's true. So I think such as uh, 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 Sacha was on to something when she started talking about when she started uh, working at the um, working at the ministry and. Um, well, you know my obsession with with the political system. So, so my obsession is with uh, looking at how the the way that politics are um, are played, so to speak, in the country. How that uh, in countries like ours, uh, which are small countries. Uh, um, um, barely out of uh, uh, colonial rule, etc. cetera, um, still trying to find their bearings. So, um, so for, for me, it's in, interesting to see how the way that uh, political parties are organized uh, and how um, coalition government is formed and how that is then contributing to uh, uh, cases of bad governance. Um, and what I've seen over the years is that indeed with, uh, uh, with the fact that with each government, with each new, new election cycle, um, rules are being set aside. Um, so if you look at causes of corruption, uh, it's it's kind of a, a, a who do you, how do you call it a vicious circle where um, weak institutions beget corruptions beget corruption but corruption um, weakens the institutions you, you know you see what I mean yeah. and yeah so let's just leave it at that because I think uh, Sacha explicitly said that she wanted to get into the causes of corruption. Sacha? Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Sacha? Yeah. Um, that is uh, exactly, and it, and it really uh, uh, has everything to do with what you are seeing, Sharda, is that 
the problems are not are not problems the causes are not in the procedures and the processes the, the causes i guess but we have to do we still have to do research on that is in the social structure of the country um what i read in the literature and i'm talking about um uh, countries with a colonial past so countries which are very new as independent countries and for that reason the previous elites who were the ruling classes in the, in, in the economies they left right they left physically but they were still present and local classes of groups of people organized or not in political parties wanted to or are headed to obtain the previous positions in the society right like you and um the more a, a society is segmented the difficult the more difficult it is to get homogeneous rules and regulations and behavior in this case as to what is good governance and what is corruption and um as and i've taken a look at some countries in uh where the the segmentation of the population is very big in by segmentation i mean um uh, the way the way that the population organizes itself apart from political parties you have religion we have a language we have ethnic groups we have i'm sorry i'm looking at my pc we have uh, addresses meaning where you come from um i have met persons living in the districts who didn't know that paying to get uh to get to see the districts commissioner was a bribe um and um i saw persons at the minister of finance who came to ask for um papers of the then minister because that was um uh, used in their in their in the group that they they um were born in so you do favors mutually favors that is why networks uh, exist so um in suriname we have this the ethnic groups we have the religion we have extended families we have group of of, of land owners and non land owners we have bureaucrats we have an um business communities and within the business communities you have three three different sorts of businesses even in religion for instance my father was muslim but there are other kinds of muslims you have three four kinds of muslims in one religious group so the segmentation in suriname is humongous it is very very big and that is why it is so difficult for one for everybody to understand why it's not okay to help my nephew at a job and and the solutions that is the question 3 that mafra gave us what do we do about it the other side is that for instance in countries like the the nordic countries like sweden and so there's kind of like a much less segmentation everybody speaks the same language and has the same meaning to concepts so um, well, yeah. let's, let's stick to the caribbean i want to go to george where okay. i is more homogeneous uh, Uh, let me actually pick up on Sacha's last comment. I like the notion of uh, segmentation or a, a society that only is made up of different components. And uh, certainly, an extreme example in the Caribbean uh, would be Haiti, where segmentation actually, I think, to some degree, explains the inability over time. And I, I think I'm comparing Haiti today to Haiti before, rather than Haiti to the rest of the Caribbean. the inability of governance uh, to emerge in a coherent fashion and therefore also to address issues of transparency and corruption so you end up having uh segmentation between the rural and urban communities you have a linguistic segmentation where the language of the people in creole is 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 obviously also uh, uh competing if you will uh with uh, with french and increasingly also with english because of the large uh, diaspora in north america you obviously have a 
a racial segmentation and economic segmentation with the, mm -hmm. the urban wealth to some degree and to some degree a little bit rural wealth, uh, certainly not uh, uh, widely shared across the rest of the community. And this generates uh, over time, uh, the mechanisms to, to represent all of that are extremely narrow in scope. So purple parties in Haiti have traditionally been either sort of extreme ideologies that actually don't match up with the reality of many people in the community, or alternatively are personalistic. It's not unique to Haiti. So they are electoral machinery vehicles that only uh, elect someone or a group of people, but only are not sustainable uh, 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 politically. I would say there's another factor to me that's important in why we still have these environments, not only in Haiti, but throughout the Caribbean. And in, the, in some ways, in the post-colonial era, uh, other actors uh, have emerged, including international institutions, uh, the role of, of international business, NGOs. I, I would, and I, I, I'm sort of potentially criticized a little bit myself here. I think at times that international community has not been particularly disciplined uh, in, in their transactions, if you will, with local communities in the region and therefore looking the other way or a blind eye or not wanting to be too involved or engaged when there is in fact clearly corruptive behavior uh, that emerges. Uh, they, they may study it, but they don't say, I'm, I'm not so sure that they're always critical enough. Okay, I want to make a point now about the institutions because I think that uh, you need strong institutions, let's say the, the judiciary, the police, the tax department, whatever, um, even strong political parties, um, strong civil society. Um, to actually keep corruption uh, within certain uh, bonds. If institutions are weak, I think you will get more corruption, but what um, is your opinion of that? Any one of you? But your if institutions are weak, you'll get more corruption. That's, that's like saying, when it rains, you get wet. It's, it's, it's a fact. Yeah. Haiti is a good example where you have weak institutions, yet at the same time, you've had some efforts in recent years uh, to address corruption. And the, in the Haitian case, and it's not unique to Haiti, uh, the Petro Caribe, the Venezuelan uh, discount oil program, which in the case of Haiti has actually been investigated uh, and both by, by a parliamentary commission as well as by the a rough equivalent, if you will, of the Congressional Budget Office, a sort of governmental mechanism. It has also been the ingredient for a significant civil society pushback in the last 18 months, uh, some of it more violent than it probably should have been. Uh, so there's that engagement, but it, it, sort, of, it sort of is an ability to, tran in a, unable to translate into more distinct political action for a number of different reasons. One of them is the one that Martin you just mentioned, which is the we judiciary or the lack of independence of, of the judiciary mm. uh, to actually translate uh, or enforce uh, the outcome of some of this investigation. And as a result, it's a standoff. Uh, and, and the country clearly has not put this issue behind it. Yeah, but I think of, um... I think in Suriname, we, we, I would say that we still have, um, we're still lucky enough to have a judiciary that is relatively independent, um, but you don't, uh, uh, what we've seen, for example, in, in the cases of corruption uh, in the past, well, past year and past months, um, there are, elements in our legislation that hampers their ability to, to fight corruption, to, to prosecute corruption uh, when it comes to uh, office holders, when it comes to 
um, uh, how do you say it, from the political office holders. So, um, so it is an interlinkage between the institutions, the legislation, uh, etc., and how they uh, how they interact. Um, so it's more than just so you can have a, a, a an institution institution that is relatively de uh, independent, um, but that lacks capacity uh, to really uh, investigate and prosecute. Uh, because of human resource uh, uh, capacity uh, problems, uh, um, financial capacity problems, and you have the element of uh, uh, legislative um, obstacles. Um, but I do agree with, with uh, uh, the fact that you have, a, a, tomorrow, I don't want to jump the gun here, but I think tomorrow in the panel tomorrow, uh, there's going to be talk about the, uh, for example, the of there's going to be talk about the oil and gas industry, the extractive industry, and my colleague Raya will give will will probably tell the story of why uh, as Proyecta and as the Citizens Initiative, um, uh, uh, so many years ago we decided that we we needed uh, to bring the EITI into Suriname just to. Uh, 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 to, to use it as a linchpin actually to get certain uh, institutional strengthening because if as a country you commit to become a partner of the EITI, you will have to comply with certain rules and, and regulations. So, uh, um, so that for us was a, a way of trying to help establish stronger institutions. As an example, uh, Martin, Okay, so I it's, a, it's it a question of checks and balances, better checks and balances. Absolutely. That don't work. But but okay. if I if I may, it's a it's a question of checks and balances. And I, I want to go back to an earlier point in the discussion. And I also want to tell us ourselves that we have to check the Q and A's uh, uh, because I see there are twelve Q and A's and, and maybe we should look at them. Um, but I want to go back to, to something before uh, when we talked about uh, uh, the, the causes of corruption and Sacha was talking about the segmentation, what do you call it segmentation? And um, we, we were discussing, I, when I was a student, uh, uh, one of the first um, seminars I went to was by George Lemming. The, uh, you know George Lemming, Martin Schalke, Martin? You know, uh, yes. Lem, who, who did a, a presentation, and there was one sentence uh, that I'll never forget. Well, I forgot the sentence, but but what he meant was that he said our problem in the Caribbean is that we have such small societies. The problem in the Caribbean is that if you want to get ahead fast and become rich fast, there's only one trajectory. If you don't come from rich parents, there's one trajectory for you, and that is get into politics. And so that's the fastest way to, uh, to get status and to get rich. And so once you get into that position, there's no way you want to leave that position. So in other countries that are more established, you have the business community. You, uh, after you've been the president, you, you get plushy jobs. Uh, 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 you get very, very comfy jobs everywhere else. Now, um, I just wanted to say this. So, so, you have to look at uh, 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 how is politics organized um, in order to get there. And once you get there, um, corruption also exists because uh, um, the people in power have to use their power to give out rent, to, to give out favors, um, to, 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 to give out benefits to stay in power. So, so it's also always that, uh, that circle, mm -hmm. just to, to add that. Okay, yeah. Satya wanted to say something. Um, yes, I, I, I'm sure it, everything will be, you know, will be more clear, made more clear if we do the publication because this, the time is very short. But it is like the chicken and the egg thing, yeah. Why are there so, why are the institutions weak? 
because uh, no, the societies are weak and why are the societies weak because the institutions are weak we have to go deeper than that right and and um for for us to do that we have to map the where people are coming from what is their background what are their belief systems um why what is um for instance good what what do they see as good and to counter that to make one to to talk all uh, one language with respect to good governance and i think it would be good if we have um this this concept this behavior and this uh, this this drive in an uh, an authority that will do all this work and that will not a, just like COVID explain to everybody what are the what are the threats of not having good governance how does it hurt people how does it hurt the economy how does it hurt job creation if people are corrupt and and pay bribes and so this all will need to be made clear to everyone in the country that is participating in the economy. Uh, even children at school and in, in high school, from, uh, for instance, should know what is good governance and why it is important and why it is not something you know, up there that is not uh, for them uh, to, to, to worry about, but then they'd have to just go on and, and, and live their life. I think this has to be made clear, you know, um, all the forms of, of, of corruption, of um, all the, the ways in which uh, corruption is um, executed and um, how, how it can be, uh, um, how do you say it, the maiden? From that, oh, how, how, how you fight against it. Yes, yes, yes. So um, we need to heal. To make it to take it to the next level and make it a more institutional approach than this. If, if I may, Martin, uh, there's uh, two things. Uh, um, I I don't think that. Well, let's not say I don't think. Uh, it is part uh, of of what people should understand and that you should get uh, 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 young children to understand. Uh, Preact is doing a, a program uh, of has been doing a program on uh, democracy with children, and um, it's it's not just you you don't go into the classroom and say let's talk about corruption. But what you need to do is uh, um, once you get um, there's an enormous uh, uh, there's enormous importance in teaching. Uh, and talking about um, in in talking about civic education, in in talking about uh, how democracy works, what human rights are, et cetera, et cetera. And from this, so so it it becomes a much more normative. Uh, the society is being driven much more from a normative standpoint, where we agree on principles, uh, where you recognize what your rights are as a citizen. Where, uh, so from that point of view, you recognize and are embedded with these values and norms. So you recognize when there is uh, corruption. So you recognize when there's no transparency and you recognize what your rights are. And then you will demand that governance. You, you will demand certain behaviors. You will demand stronger uh, institutions. So, so other way around for us. Um, okay. And I have one, if I may, I have one question for uh, for George, if I may, Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in his in his opening statement, uh, um, he talked about you talked a bit about um, that we have relatively uh, good developed uh, regional institutions and a, a, a relative culture of transparency and uh, and etc. So, um, were you referring to the CARICOM and, and uh, uh, the Caribbean uh, and the Caribbean Court of Justice, et, et cetera? Um, do you see those as strong institutions in the fight against corruption and for good governance? Uh, yes, uh, I, I do, but with the following caveat, which is uh, they, they could be much more effective 
than they presently are. In some ways, the the electoral dispute in Guyana shows the potential weakness uh, even of a regional institution that Guyana is a, is a part of. What I was suggesting is that the region actually is well endowed in these in these mechanisms, in these reg regional mechanisms. But but most of those mechanisms ultimately are not playing the role that they could be playing in the area of governance uh, and more narrowly the issue of of, of corruptive uh, of behavior. Uh, but but in some ways the foundations of those dialogues could actually and norms development of norms could actually be built without having to create something totally new and and uh, and different. Uh, Caricom is one of them, and all of its sort of subgroups, uh, particularly uh, across regional discussion uh, involving the ministers of justice or attorney generals, however that's organized. There are private professional organizations that cut across these environments, which I think could be energized with, with some additional uh, uh, focus. The, within those mechanisms, including the Caribbean Development Bank, uh, there in some ways is also an ability for the region to address uh, not only issues that, it, that, it, that, that relate to corruption in, within each country, but also the ability of the region to counteract or respond to the response of the international community vis-a-vis -vis those kinds of issues, and for example, de-risking uh, policies or the increasing uh, blacklisting, to use the term, mm -hmm. of some Caribbean countries by some in the EU countries. So the, there's a there's a, an ability for the region in some ways to coalesce on these issues in a more coherent and effective way. And the mechanisms are the institutional mechanisms are sort of there, but it lacks energy and consensus. Yeah. Uh, Again, we have to that person. Okay. Um, Martin. We have to check the time. We have some questions from the audience. And um, actually, I want to take one of these questions. And so that uh, and one of them is, what are the biggest priorities for legislative reform? Can we check corruption with legis legislation? And what, what do we have to do there? Uh, Anyone want to address that? I'm I'm reading the the I was I was reading all the questions. What what was your question again, Martin? Um, what are the biggest priorities for legislative reform? The Freedom of Information Act. Okay, very good we one. Desperately, desperately need a trans. So so far from the the, the point of view from uh, transparency and accountability. It's freedom of information. The second thing is the way that budgets are presented in parliament. We need budget transparency. We need uh, 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 accountability from the government in terms of uh, uh, presenting her, who uh, said that Sacha Yari Keninga? Annual report. Her annual reports. Um, all the, oh Martin, we have a whole list. But let's start with that. Uh, 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 let's start with that. Um, and of course, having learned from uh, these past weeks and months, uh, the whole issue of um, political functionaries. Yeah, we have a case in Suriname where the Minister of Finance uh, has to be questioned in cases of corruption. And Parliament, the former Parliament, blocked it actually yeah. uh, because you need permission from Parliament if a minister is involved. Yeah. So the process needs permission. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All political. Uh, uh, the you need the the prosecutor needs permission from Parliament to investigate cases of corruption when it involves somebody uh, in elected office. And I mean, come on. Can I add so to, to there, is law. Law, there is a law, there are various laws, uh, to be precise, in, which governs the financial management of the country. They are there, the comptability laws, they are just recently yeah. updated. So it is not a question of law. Why 
despite the law being there, do people do not parties and and and, and ministers and do not adhere to the law? No, because that's they get away with it easily. You you see, that's that's the whole that's the whole thing because they get away with it. And why do they get away with it? Because people don't know. You know, the the average person in Suriname doesn't know what I, the consequences are of not of getting away with it. Yeah. That's why so, we need to broaden the concept. Yeah. And that's why it needs stronger institutions. Okay, we are well, well, out out among of other among other things. And uh, can I just react to George uh, uh, for one second? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to say that. Um, um, Thank you for your optimistic look out. Uh, um, my my, uh, my view of CARICOM usually is, is I say, why are why is the CARICOM the way? Uh, why is the CARICOM moving so slow? And then I have to remind myself that the CARICOM is 16 countries like Suriname. <laughs> that is one thing, and the other thing is, is it, it's a political. It's the CARICOM is made up of the political elite of our countries. So I don't know if I can be that optimistic, but I, I do, I, I am glad to have had this insight because maybe that is also something that we will need to look into in, in how, how do we prod the CARICOM to become more, to pay more attention. So thank you for that, George. I appreciate it. I mean, I, um... I focus on these regional mechanisms because I think they're an important part of the history of the region of the last three or four decades. Mm -hmm. But I am frustrated because I think, as I think you're suggesting uh, in your thought, uh, these mechanisms are not being used as effectively as they could be or should be. Uh, and uh, we don't have to invent something Perhaps initially we might try to simply make these institutions much more robust. And this is where uh, civil society plays an important role. And I think civil society of, the, of today is a different environment than even 15 or 20 years ago. The ability to communicate, to mobilize, to use social media in effective ways they are instruments that ultimately, I think, can put pressure on places like CARICOM. And as you say, they are political institutions, so they respond to pressure. Yeah. Thank okay, you. ladies and gentlemen, we have reached our limit, uh, 75 minutes. And I think it. Uh, tomorrow we will continue. So I want to urge everyone to tune in tomorrow for the rest of this discussion. Uh, it's clear that institutions are important. It's clear that um, civil society has to put pressure on politicians. Um, and it's clear that we need information, a good information act, so that governments give, provide the information that people uh, request and do not keep it back so that uh, things come out in the open and become more transparent. And we have not used the regional um, institutions and things that are in place as much as we could have done. So I thank you for your participation and we'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Pleasure.